Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. My name is John Hamry, uh, I'm president here at CSIS, and I welcome you to the third session that we're hosting on a topic that most Americans don't know anything about, and it's more fundamental than anything that probably affects your life in more ways than you realize, and that's standard setting. Um, uh, we'll, we'll dig into this a bit. I invite you to look at the previous recordings. Both of them were with my dear friend, Joe Batia, uh, where we talked about standard setting in the role that uh, American standard setting is uh, grounded in the private sector. Today, we're going to have a deeper conversation about standard setting, but we're going to look at the way the collaborative nature of it between the private sector, uh, and I'm delighted that Phil Wenbaum is here. Uh, he's with Intel, a very senior uh, executive at Intel, uh, deep experience in standard setting, with Walt Copen. Dr. Walt Copen is the head of the National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, and also undersecretary at the Commerce Department, and heads up this remarkable institution, NIST, that is deeply involved in standards, but the st standard setting in America is really led in the private sector. And I welcome back Joe Batia. Joe is, of course, the president of the American National Standards Institute, and it is the kind of the grand architect of America's engagement in standard setting. This is going to be a very interesting conversation, and I'm delighted that all three of you have joined joined me today. Let me uh, let me just begin by saying, you know, it, uh, we said in our first. Uh, two sessions that standard setting is in America unique because it comes from the bottom up um, uh, and it really involves all the stakeholders. The government has an important role, but not, a, not, not the lead role. Could I ask each of the three of you just to reflect in your own way, and Joe, we'll start with you, then Walt, and then to you, Phil. Um, you know, how, how does standard setting, what is your role in standard setting, just so that our audience can understand the three of your perspectives that they're going to hear today? Joel, let's start with you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, John, and uh, great to be with Walt and, and uh, have Phil with us. I think it'll be a great conversation. Uh, I want to start with the basics because we have different people sometimes. Uh, standardization is, as you said, is at the heart of the U.S. competitiveness our prosperity and our quality of life. 93% of all the global exports rely on conformance to standards. And I've said it before and I'll say it again, standards and compliance to them are two sides of the same coin. And together they bring the full currency to the power of standardization. And together standards and compliance to them protects the health and safety of citizens, drives new and emerging technologies and facilitates global trade. What's more, standards really affect everyday activities of our entire life. We're, from the air we breathe, to the food we eat, to the technologies that support things like this very webcast that we're participating in. And it's a great uh, promotional thing uh, to see standardization at play, in my view. It ensures safety, it ensures quality, it ensures interoperability. So for the, more than 100 years, ANSI has been proud to serve as the coordinator of the US private sector standardization system, facilitating solutions that produce addressing of the national and global priorities. And as our voice in international standardization, we at ANSI coordinate both the US policy and US technical input to two of the largest and most recognized standards organizations in the world, ISO and IEC. In our unique role, we also provide neutral forum for all diverse interests and we know we have a lot of diverse interests in US, uh, both from the public and private sector to work together to advance powerful standards-based solutions. And lastly, we also have the responsibility to guard the integrity of the system, make sure things are done right, make sure people are not exploiting the weaknesses that they find in transitional issues, for example. And it's driven by public-private partnership, which we'll talk about because Walt is with us today, and it's driven by the needs of the market and by public interest. So that's where I think we sit in. Thank you, Joe. Walt, uh, you, uh, I always thought standards were done by NIST. 
but I'm <laughs> learning. But you do have a crucial role. Why don't you share that with us? In, indeed, uh, the United States approach, uh, first and foremost, in technology standards development uh, represents a genuine public-private partnership. It is industry-led, private sector-led, um, and uh, that's very important uh, for the American way of life. Uh, it ensures that uh, industrial outcomes are going to have the greatest potential uh, for impact and value creation for entrepreneurship because they're supported by standards that are the underpinning of trust. Uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology NIST, has a crucial role in this public-private partnership, and it's actually unique in the world in the entire standards ecosystem. NIST develops and disseminates measurement standards and services. Uh, these are measurements that are made by industries and sensors and um, allow really every industry to have the traceability, that foundation of trust that goes back to how you can measure it, how you can quantify it and, and determine it. And so NIST is the National Metrology Institute, the Measurement Science Institute of America. And so measurements and standards uh, work side by side because the measurements are actually the tool of conformity assessment. What Joe was talking about uh, is uh, the ability to actually verify performance and interoperability. You have to be able to do that in a way that's quantitative, meaningful, and can translate um, into any market uh, globally. And so having this uh, traceability allows us to have confidence of products that are on the manufacturing floor. It supports safety and efficacy in, in healthcare. And ultimately the uh, NIST technical staff uh, work side by side with the uh, private sector colleagues um, in uh, well over a hundred standards development organizations around the world. and. Uh, over 1,500 uh, work streams and, uh, and, and uh, project groups um, because it is a public-private partnership and it's necessary to be successful in standards through technological excellence. And that's the partnership that NIST brings as well as the measurement science leader in the US. We coordinate the federal sector's participation with the private sector. Uh, NIST has worked with ANSI for all 100 uh, plus oh, years yeah. of ANSI's existence and more. NIST celebrates its 120th anniversary uh, next year in 2021. And it's been a long standing partnership. Uh, it's also a, uh, it's, it's like a family relationship too. We don't always agree. NIST always brings a strong point of view. Um, and we also seek to ensure that the interests of the public are being appropriately taken into account. Uh, there are many important elements of strategy coordination that take place between the public sector and the private sector. And I must say that all participants in the standards process are welcome. And it's necessary actually to bring that public-private partnership in order to reduce risk, to reduce transaction costs. And the government here in the United States and governments around the world are also procurers of goods and services and count on standards to establish the efficacy of our communications infrastructure, our ability to have uh, video conference calls as we're, uh, as we're having today. Um, and uh, the flag that you see behind me at the uh, NIST uh, offices in Gaithersburg, Maryland, uh, for the U.S. Department of Commerce uh, is a focus on U.S. innovation and industrial competitiveness. That's what the flag stands for, uh, for uh, us at NIST. Um, and so as part of our mandate, the only way that industrial competitiveness <laughs> is assured is through industry. And in so doing, it, uh, it resonates with our free market system uh, where, where the government is a partner uh, and a key stakeholder as well in standards outcomes for the United States and around the world. Thank you, Walt. Um, Phil, uh, when I asked both Joe and Walt who would be the best guy from industry to bring in, they both nominated you. Now, so you, you carry a large role here, not just to speak for Intel, but the private sector in general. Why don't you share with us your view on, on this this standard setting process in America. Oh, thank you, John, for the kind words. It's uh, it's an honor to be here and, and participating with you. Uh, from an industry perspective, standards are really a tool. It can 
a tool that can be used to pursue different uh, challenges and opportunities. Uh, for example, standards can enable products to interoperate, which is very important in the tech industry. Uh, standards are fundamentally important to enabling global supply chains, which is the way all complex technology products are, are developed. Uh, they provide, uh, they can provide businesses and consumers with assurance that a product will meet their expectations. And standards provide uh, encapsulated knowledge that allows a business to, uh, to be smarter and better, for example, in how it protects its data. Um, standards uh, also provide platforms in combination that uh, enable new innovation. Think about uh, the standards that define the internet, which has enabled all sorts of innovation. So standards are a versatile and very powerful tool, but always I, I look at it as a tool that, that that's used to achieve some, some other outcome. Intel participates in more than 300 standard setting organizations it, and standards are very important to Intel. I think uh, as with many tech companies, we uh, implement standards in our products and services. We use standards in our manufacturing and our, our product development. So uh, we, and, and that's why we participate in so many organizations. My role is to, uh, is to really help Intel standards participation be more effective by uh, making contributions that, uh, that help the industry, uh, the, the, the standard system overall do a better job. Thanks, Phil. Let me, uh, each, of, each of you have described how, um, how, how important standards are and uh, the, the role that ANSI, NIST, uh, and Intel play. Uh, let me ask you to go inside the question of public-private partnerships. How does that really work in, in, in the real world? Let's, Joe, start with you. Yeah, uh, I think it's a very good question because uh, I want to make sure that you understand that public-private partnership in the US is really what sets us apart from the rest of the world. Uh, we have a bottom-up approach. We have an approach that engages all the constituencies, all the people, not just industry, but government, uh, consumers, uh, you name it, any element that is affected by the standard or application of it has a right to be involved and many times they are. Sometimes they're not because they are unique standards that require compatibility or technical interaction, maybe don't need the consumer input. But here in the US, the system being bottom up is power, private sector led, government supported and market driven. So I think it involves everybody and that's what gives us the dynamic, flexible and quickly responsive approach that has made us probably the most successful organization, I'm sorry, most successful country in the world using the tools that everybody else uses in all other countries. One of the biggest users of standards is the US government. And US government is a very active participant, not just NIST, but every federal agency participates in the private sector process. And many of the standards that are developed by private sector process actually replace what would have been a government effort in most countries. This doesn't happen in too many countries. Even in big economies like EU or in China, everything goes through the filter from the governmental perspective. They control and direct what gets used as standards, what gets you know, evolved and what cannot be done. And I think that is an important role that both NIST and ANSI play where we develop solutions, not just through standards, but also through facilitating different initiatives that are national or global priorities or challenges cross-sector groups such as ANSI Collaboratives, which is a technology that we use to engage people from all sectors. And this is especially important where consensus is needed, where differences of opinion exist, where public sector is actively engaged, private sector is actively engaged. And we create these collaboratives to do cross-sector activities and create solutions. These things have developed issues in areas like Homeland Security. Department of Homeland Security didn't exist. After the 9-11 attacks, they came to ANSI and asked us to set up some systems so the standards could be developed that would secure our homeland and security out of that would emanate. Nanotechnology is another area. Health IT, a major issue, it affects us all. Additive manufacturing. Just a few weeks ago, ANSI's unmanned aircraft system collaborative, including a cross-sector group of 300 individuals from 175 organizations released a second phase of a standardization roadmap to do what? To support the safe growth of drones in the industry. Actually, the concept emerged as a direct request by FAA and other agencies, which were grappling with the idea of, on how to best facilitate the effective integration of drones into the national airspace. 
So if you follow what's going on in this space, you know every major institution in US is drooling at the opportunity to use drones as solutions. They're already used tremendously. People don't realize that. They're used in agriculture, they're used in home building, they're used in scanning techniques, they're used in gasoline pipelines through thousands of feet of thousands of miles of uh, you know, feeding pipes. So all that goes on. So what we do collectively in the private sector and public sector together benefits us and gives us the leadership in the international arena also, which is what is really the best part of this whole deal. I think John, John we can't hear you. Let me jump in, uh, John, uh, perhaps with some uh, comments as well, because uh, Joe, you're absolutely right. Uh, the private sector led approach, but uh, the coordination amongst the various parties also in the United States government is very important. And uh, they're, they're key stakeholders, there's procurement, there's, there's issues of commerce and, uh, and safety uh, for the American people, as well as their ability to trade across borders. Uh, standardization has become such an important uh, element uh, in commerce and in trade, uh, because uh, if they're misused, um, testing, certification, and standards can actually become barriers to trade. Um, and so the role of government, uh, together with the private sector in the U.S., is to ensure that our, our trade relationships are indeed open and fair, that uh, standards and other approaches are not used to inhibit trade, but actually to open up new markets that are on the basis of trust and the ability to verify. And the other element that's just so important uh, for an organization like NIST that leads the US government side in, in standards uh, is to also provide complementary tools and frameworks. For example, the cybersecurity framework, the development of new tools and in artificial intelligence, and the privacy framework that was just <laughs> issued earlier this year uh, is an important adjunct to the standards process because it provides opportunities for organizations to demonstrate excellence um, as they also provide uh, uh, standards uh, leadership and products that, uh, that comply. The United States actually enjoys a tremendous public-private sector synergy. Um, and I would say it's reflected in the ANSI and, uh, and NIST relationship over the last uh, century. Um, and it's a relationship that genuinely has evolved as the commercial landscape, the standards landscape has, uh, has changed uh, through organizations like ISO and IEC. Our representation is organized through ANSI uh, and NIST is a participant uh, in that, that, that process as we also play a leadership role in standards collaboratives, including what you just mentioned, Joe, the, uh, the role of drones, um, Homeland Security, healthcare, related standards and, and so on. And translating uh, the learnings that we have from the government side then into new trade deals, such as the USMCA that was recently ratified, the US-Mexico-Canada Trade uh, Pact, uh, that uh, very specific text in technical barriers to trade ref reflects these standardization principles that we're talking about here for the United States openness, integrity, diversity. Um, thank you. Thank you, Walt. Um, uh, Phil, um, your, your perspective on the partnership side, I mean, you know, because I'm sure that many things you actually are the ones that initiate the concern, but you have to, you're working with the government. What is it, what is this public private partnership like from an industry perspective? Uh, thanks, John. Well, I, I think uh, Joe and Walt have explained this very well. I, from a practical point of view, uh, from an industry perspective, I think this is about uh, industry and government working together uh, to develop standards that meet the needs of both communities. And by doing that, uh, the resulting standards are both better and also more successful than they otherwise would have been. That's very powerful. So this is a partnership that works very well for, for U.S. interests. Um, I, I was John, going to ask, I, yes, uh, Joe, sorry, go ahead. A, a good example, a nice example, only because it's so timely to talk about it. Uh, people have been watching what's going on with 5G and what's happening with China and US and the Huawei thing. And, you know, so this is a great example of where NIST and the private sector are working together 
federal agencies and private sector are working together. We have a private sector and a public sector initiative going on between ANSI and NIST leading that to basically manage creation of a national strategy that will apply internationally on how to deal with the securement of 5G network and its further use in the, you know, in the countries across the globe and in the US. And as the technology is improved, so we go to 6G and other solutions. And we are basically working with the leadership of the industry. Phil was part of the team that we had our first meeting with. We had all the industry associations from the ICT sector that are actively engaged. We had people from the public sector. We have several federal agencies involved and their representation was there. And we're basically looking to find out what is it that we can do to create a solution that is responding to a you know, official mandate that has been issued by president. And we want to make sure that we create that solution, at least in principle, by the middle of or end of September, I don't know what the deadline is. And we're working hard on that. And the teams from ANSI and NIST have dedicated themselves to advance this very critical area of technology and protecting the security of the systems and the networks in the entire country, in fact, globally through those solutions. And that's what we do. And we do that all the time. This is just a good example of what's happening right now. That's, that's very helpful, Joe. Uh, uh, I was going to ask about ANSI and this relationship, but you've already identified that. Phil, let me turn to you to ask, um, you know, uh, you're, you've got at Intel, phenomenal company. You've got lots of research and development going on. You're looking out into the future. Uh, how is how do you decide when you need to start moving through these channels to establish standards? How does that work in in from a perspective of the private sector? Uh, thanks, John. That's a good question. So in Intel's approach to standards is largely decentralized. And by that, I mean, and I think we're typical of most uh, large companies now, where there are standards experts in each of our business units and labs who are, are, are knowledgeable and, and experienced in participating in standards, but they're also very close to the technology development in their lab or the business problem that their group is solving, the product roadmaps that they're developing. And, and they identify and bubble up uh, opportunities to participate in a, in a standards effort or to create something new. Uh, and our, our small central teams uh, consult with them and help, help advise them, but really the decisions are made in, in, in individual labs and, uh, and, and business units. Phil, if I could just if I could follow up though, it it um, you know a company is spending a lot of money on on research and development. They're looking for market advantage in that. How do you decide when you want to make it a standard that's broadly based, as opposed to keeping it a company advantage? Then it's it's best to stay narrowly within company interests. How how what how how does yeah. that work for you? That's that's also a very good question, and and it might be more art than science, uh, be, because uh, in some uh, you know some technologies just want to be standardized to be successful. Uh, you know, a proprietary networking technology is not going to go anywhere, for example. Uh, but other, other times, there's an opportunity to uh, to to innovate and in and in in differentiate uh, with proprietary products and and to and to get a good return for that. So I think that uh, we're always trying to optimize the business, but also need to recognize the realities of where are their networks and, uh, and other dynamics that would drive a technology to, to want to be standardized and not differentiated. Walt, you previously were in, in the private sector. Uh, your reflections on that question? Uh, absolutely. And, and let me first say uh, thanks to Phil for uh, your leadership in the ISO IEC Joint uh, Technical Committee number one. Um, our NIST scientists and engineers just truly uh, enjoy engaging with you and the Intel colleagues. Um, and, uh, and we're contributing to a wide variety of uh, programs under this uh, JTC1 uh, leadership that you're providing, including in artificial intelligence. The role that, uh, that standards play for industry uh, can be either um, a tool on the offense, a tool on the defense, uh, but regardless, they are 
an essential part of, of doing business. And uh, as uh, Phil was saying, uh, it, it's a strategic decision by the entity to decide whether to move something to, uh, to an open uh, standard uh, uh, approach versus uh, maintaining a, a proprietary position, at least for a time. And uh, NIST, the Department of Justice and the uh, US Patent and Trademark Office have recently um, issued uh, some uh, policy documents um, on the importance of standards essential patents. Uh, because innovation is recognized through the standards process. Um, and, uh, and so there's a give and take in commerce uh, through the uh, patents then that become uh, recognized as, uh, as have, having contributed to a standard and financial rewards then can accrue to the inventor. Standards uh, themselves actually create that foundation of trust in the marketplace that I was talking about that also benefits the entrepreneur. Um, and so if an entrepreneurial enterprise um, has developed a technology that actually uh, results in a new standard or that uh, enables the uh, realization of a, of a standard, um, they have immediate access to the marketplace, a marketplace uh, where they can then uh, play with, uh, with the other uh, uh, competitors. And so this role of, uh, of standards in enabling innovation as part of our American innovation ecosystem uh, that we should really cherish and, yeah. uh, and that uh, benefit of the public sector, the private sector working together, and also the benefit of having people within the government side who are experienced in industry and in the standard space uh, provides greater commonality, as uh, Joe was talking about before, looking strategically together at the future of the standards landscape in the United States in a very different competitive environment that this nation has ever faced. Yeah. Uh, Joe, did you want to jump in? Yeah, if I may, I have to start by something fun. So I want to say when industry succeeds, the nation succeeds. I mean, it's a simple statement, but it's really true. You think about it. Uh, because over 90% of U.S. goods exports are affected by standards and technical regulations. All of them are intertwined with what industry does. They provide the intelligence, the knowledge, the expertise, and the, I guess, the largest level of familiarity with what it is that we need to be looking at as criteria that will become ultimately a component of a standard. Be it done in the you know, consensus-based process or a consortium process, which we'll talk about later. Uh, all of those solutions are designed to make us successful. And industry plays a tremendous role. Quite frankly, the development of standards is where they begin. I see, I see Phil, I don't know, 30 times a year, maybe all over the world, sometimes even in US. And we get together and we talk about it. And the JTC1 committee that we have, it's a phenomenal committee. It's the largest committee that has produced the solutions bigger than anybody else in the world, perhaps several countries put together. Uh, in the ICT sector, which is where most of the innovation and technology has come from. And in the intellectual property rights area that Walt was talking about, believe it or not, the biggest committee on international property rights protection is one that is managed by ANSI. And we try to harmonize those provisions with international organizations by having ISO and IEC and ITUT align with that thinking, and most of the times they do. So we're working at different angles. When we say we're a standards organization, we're doing injustice to what we do. I think we do a lot more things. And the critical role that development of standards play in the advancement of technology, in the advancement of innovation and scaling of that. So the general public all over the world can benefit from that and you know, take advantage of taking us to different steps in the future. I think that's what this is all about. And we're very proud to be part of that solution. Even though I'm not industry, but I'm very happy to be working with them, they are on our board, they are on our committees, they are members of our activities, whatever we do domestically and internationally, and it doesn't happen without them. Um, I'm learning a lot listening to the three of you, but let, let me learn a little bit more and, and bring it into focus by, let's get a, an example. Let's, let, if we could, let's talk about uh, artificial intelligence as a, as a focal point. Um, it, um, 
you know, it's a it's a word that's used widely. We don't most people that say it like me don't know what we're talking about, uh, but it actually has very deep uh, technical dimensions. Uh, let's, so let, I'll, I want to ask each of the three of you, but Walt, let me start with you to talk about artificial intelligence as a as a as a focus area for standard setting. John, thanks. Uh, it's a great example uh, of how standards uh, can enable uh, rapid development as well as a foundation of trust. And AI is moving very, very rapidly. It's fertile ground for standards development, uh, very rapid pace research and development and new product introductions involving AI. And so to be able to provide that uh, foundation of, uh, of trust and utility for, for artificial intelligence applications, there's a very clear need for tools and standards for the technology acceptance and for its appropriate use. And so NIST is working on multiple standards development, including uh, what I mentioned earlier on under Phil's chair with the JTC1 um, and uh, also through ANSI as our uh, national um, members to the ISO and, uh, and the IEC. Now, NIST's uh, experience in the technology that underpin AI go back many, many decades in national language processing and reference data sets, cybersecurity, smart manufacturing, et cetera. Um, and industry in partnership with NIST is looking to drive consensus around the deployment of artificial intelligence that also brings on success of NIST cybersecurity and privacy frameworks that I mentioned earlier that outline voluntary standards and guidelines and best practices. It's all about managing risk, especially in a rapidly moving environment where sometimes unexpected connections are made. So to that end, we provide uh, independent tools and assessments uh, for artificial intelligence, such as for the performance of facial recognition technologies. So it's been very helpful for NIST to provide these tools and independent assessments of commercial and non-commercial products for the community to look at the strengths as well as the weaknesses, the inherent biases, including racial biases that we've seen embedded in artificial intelligence code or from the training sets that are used. And so this is another very positive role that the government plays um, in fields such as artificial intelligence, providing independent data to industry and to policymakers that can guide future choices, guide future standards, guide future product selections. And uh, as a result, uh, NIST was also called out in an executive order that uh, came out last year for maintaining American leadership in artificial intelligence that at its heart had a plan for prioritizing federal engagement in the development of standards for AI. And so it's recognized at the highest levels of government that standards play a very important role. Uh, it allows um, us to maintain that, uh, that open, transparent, voluntary consensus process that brings us together between all the government agencies and with the private sector. And, uh, and that's a close partnership also uh, with ANSI and and so this, this plan very much reflects the American principles that, that uh, all of us have been talking about today. Um, it's a bottoms up process, but you need to sometimes work within strategic frameworks as Joe and I are working on for 5G standards uh, 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 to, uh, to look to the future of advanced communications in a way that we can enhance the efficiency of the public and the private sector working together. Uh, Joe? Uh, yeah, I think uh, quite frankly, from artificial intelligence is going to apply to everything. Uh, it's the area that is going to be dealing on issues with healthcare, with financial service, to even COVID response efforts. I see work being done in this area to accelerate the data analysis and the use of knowledge that we capture at a very speedy race, uh, speedy way to help unlock the promise of AI and remove the barriers of adoption of these solutions, the standards of these criteria. Globally relevant and accepted standards are absolutely the key. Without that, nothing happens. There's no trust, there's no reliability, there's no value. So the time to be involved in this work, 
in the artificial intelligence area is now. And the US standardization community and our industry and all of us are actively prepared to do that. As the chair of JTC1, I'm sure Phil will have a few things to say. I'm looking forward to hearing those. But I can tell you from our part uh, for US member body to ISO and IEC and to any international and uh, regional organizations, we are extremely proud of the US international leadership in this area. In late 2017, US assumed leadership of a newly formed JTC1 subcommittee on artificial intelligence. It's called SC42, with ANSI serving as the secretariat. So we have quite a bit of clout in how this goes and where it goes. So this is the first standardization committee of its kind that is looking at the entire artificial intelligence ecosystem. It's looking at not just one technology, but also a variety of software and hardware enabling technology, including machine learning, deep learning, knowledge representation, all can be applied to potentially unlimited number of applications almost in every industry sector. And the US also leads one of the SC42's working groups on big data, which is a very important activity. And that has its own cross activity you know, benefits in various sectors. And it's going to be getting more and more engaging for all of us at all levels in the government sector, in the private sector, with the consumers, with the users, and with the organizations all over the globe that are going to hopefully learn from what we do in US. And that is the hope that we want to maintain the leadership like we have in JTC1 for 30 plus years with the leadership coming from people like Phil for many, many decades. I'll turn it over to you, Phil. Phil, that's a heck of a start. <laughs> Thank you, Walton Show. Um, yeah, as we've discussed, uh, JTC1 is an important committee in ISO and IEC. All the uh, information technology standards are developed there uh, so that they can be applied across other ISO and IEC technical committees. Um, and, and this is important because uh, t information technology is so pervasive, it's being applied across so many sectors. So by consolidating that standardization work in one joint committee, which is pretty large now uh, and spans a bunch of different areas, uh, it, it, it enables uh, ISO and IEC to, to, to uh, develop standards that are applied easily. Uh, artificial intelligence came from a US proposal to JTC1 back in 2017, uh, and it was accepted and the US uh, ANSI holds the secretary and provides the chair now. It's grown very quickly. Uh, there's 46 countries participating. Uh, they've produced uh, half a dozen standards so far and have 15 important <clears throat> pieces of work underway, things like bias and transparency, really standards that are going to be friendly for innovation and yet help uh, society address its legitimate concerns with artificial intelligence. So uh, I believe that, that having the right standards developed uh, encourages innovation and, while addressing legitimate concerns in a way which is not going to slow things down in terms of uh, development. There's great participation uh, from NIST, from, from US industry, and really uh, all countries around the world in developing this work. There are other standards being developed. Uh, there's a lot of AI standards activity in China. We're seeing more and more standards activity in, uh, in Europe uh, in artificial intelligence. IEEE has had a program for a number of years uh, specializing on ethical considerations for autonomous systems. So JTC one's not doing the, the only work in AI, but it's very important work that I think will ultimately be a crossroads for, uh, for the world's development of AI standards. Um, Phil, your, your last comment was a good introduction. I would love to bring in some geopolitics <coughs> here. Um, you know, I, I talk in my conversations with people on standard setting and uh, everybody, or many people say that, you know, where China has made a full court press to try to learn to, you know, grab the mechanism and come to dominate global standard setting. Um, Europe has a, a different uh, relationship, it really much more a central role of the government to play. Um, can I ask each of the three of you to talk about what is it like to compete against these two other big actors in the standard setting environment? Um, Joe, do you want to start with that? Sure. Uh, Europe and China actually do share many principles with US. Uh, for example, things like consensus process and stakeholder engagement are becoming more common in both markets. And it's particularly noticeable when it becomes common in the Chinese market. Uh, they are becoming uh, basically engaged in some of the similar activities that we have 
you know, embraced for decades. Uh, but there are some key differences still that can affect U.S. stakeholders and certainly can affect the U.S. industry. For instance, the application of standards in both countries is uh, different. Uh, both systems are top-down systems. EU and Chinese governments play a much bigger role in deciding what gets done, how it gets done, what gets adopted, what gets pursued, and what doesn't. Uh, we, this can result in uh, issues for us and our companies. Uh, this can result in issues with transparency. Uh, it can be held back. It's not an open system sometimes. Uh, or how standards are incorporated into regulations and how that affects the market access for the companies that want to do business in these economies, in their large economies. So U.S. companies do report hurdles in gaining access to information about European technical activities, about not being able to participate, not until the final stages of development, if at all. That's been an issue for many, many years. And I think uh, conformity assessment procedures favored by each system may differ. This can cause challenges for U.S. companies that need to now get different product certifications. They need to comply with different types of requirements. This may also result in restrictive access to their markets. Uh, from our perspective, quite frankly, it's in the interest of U.S. and all international stakeholders to encourage constructive participation in international activities by all parties, including the ones that we're focusing on. U.S. obviously does it. Uh, China, maybe a little bit less. You know, EU perhaps needs to be more engaged on a global scale in certain areas so that we can all work towards common and acceptable solutions that would also avoid redundancy and extra cost which is ultimately passed on to the consumers and the public if it's that way. Uh, if I can just add, Joe, to uh, the comments that you've made, uh, and, and I, I agree with the principles that, uh, that you've laid out. Um, we just mentioned that uh, in the context of measurement science, uh, uh, which is truly the underpinning of the standards process itself, uh, NIST, uh, as the nation's uh, National Metrology Institute, and a global uh, leader in measurement science, actually do have uh, collaborations with the National Metrology Institutes around the world to ensure that from a foundational basis, we can actually ensure that for the purposes of science, technology, and standards, that we have a common approach, that we, that we have uh, skills that uh, we can impart to other nations to ensure that the standards that are developed actually can be deployed globally. And uh, the other uh, element of the um, standards process is what we talked about before in conformity assessment, the ability to actually validate performance against the standard and, and to have uh, uh, an, an actual uh, measurement uh, that, uh, that can, can prove uh, performance as well as interoperability. And in, in saying this, so the, the foundation of standards um, is based on this very collaborative uh, process in measurement science, but indeed US and Europe have this uh, history of collaboration as well as competition in standards. And uh, we in the US need to ensure that although it's much more a top-down organized program across uh, Europe, that uh, Europe is, is also realizing, including in fields such as artificial intelligence, that taking a, a top-down uh, approach sometimes can be an impediment to innovation. It can actually slow down their own economies and the agility of the companies working within them. And uh, the Chinese uh, system as well, having been uh, government controlled, organized as well as incentivized uh, by the government, uh, uh, also has, uh, has uh, the potential of being uh, held up as a, uh, as a barrier to trade as they can look at both local standards as well as international standards uh, and use local standards to guide procurements within country um, as well as to guide uh, trade relationships with others. And so it's a very complex dynamic that, uh, that we face with standards uh, being uh, weaponized, if you will, in this uh, in, in these interactions. Phil, how do you view this? Yeah, I might add there's there's certainly differences in the standards approach in China, Europe, and the U.S. Um, but uh, importantly, when it comes to development of international standards, there we're all playing by the same rules. Yeah. It's a level playing field, or at least the most level playing field we have. 
And because tech, the technology industry really, the markets favor international standards, they favor, favor global approaches. That's the best venue and, and gonna be the most successful venue for standards development in the tech sector. So the, 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 yes, there are differences, but when we work internationally, uh, we're all playing by the same rules and, uh, and have a, a fair chance to, uh, to, to influence the outcomes. But when I when I talk to friends in, in this world, they say that you go to now an international standards conference and half of the room is filled with Chinese. I mean, they're there because yep. the government pays for them and, you know, they're there in mass. And, uh, you know, you, you, Phil, you've got a big, powerful company behind you and they're going to send you off. But we've got a lot of little companies that don't have those resources, don't have necessarily that capacity to lose a key guy for a couple of weeks you know so what 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 should we be doing to compete more effectively uh, in international standard setting joe we'll start with you you, you okay. since you're the coordinator <laughs> <laughs> well i think there's a there's a lot that we need to think about uh, i do worry you're talking about competition with china but you're really talking about competition with you know any country in terms of being a leader of the global solution provi providing, especially in high tech and new technology areas, who's going to take the leadership role in standards? Standards are a race to success, technology-wise and prosperity-wise, both. Those are just the tools that we work on. So talking about China, China steadily has increased its influence in global settings. It's clear in their five-year plans. It's clear in many, many conversations I have with the top leaders of Chinese government that I've known for decades and some, some of them are now heading organizations and they admit to the fact that this is their strategy and we see it uh, succeeding. But I wouldn't say that we're falling short. Uh, certainly the numbers of participation, this is a separate issue that you and Walt and I will work on. Uh, we need to create a solution here in the US which puts us in par with what other governments are doing in these massive economies. We're talking about three of the largest economies in the world. China, EU, and US. Look how they invest in their success through standards. If you look at the countries that have become the biggest exporters in the world, guess who they are? China, Germany, EU, South Korea. South Korea out of nowhere because they have invested very strongly in outreach and in standards development supported by the governments liberally, uh, very generous uh, support from the EU uh, commission itself and in the, at the governmental level in each of the countries. Uh, we don't have that structure. Uh, we don't have anything that competes with China. We don't have anything that competes with the EU. We don't have anything that competes even with South Korea. So I think we need to think about how governments and policymakers can create a somewhat of a closer platform. I don't want to have a same platform because I don't think we're ever going to get there. Uh, but I think some more support would be useful. There are other things that we can do. Uh, there are many, many things that would allow us to become more successful, participating robustly in the standards development internationally, as Phil said, in the JTC1 or similar activities, which are going to create international solutions. There is a strong appetite to create one standard, one solution, one accreditation or one certification accepted everywhere. It's a dream that will never come true because most of the governments in the world will never allow that to happen, including some things going on in our own country. From the regulatory framework, that's different because their needs and maturity levels are different with the different economic development. So I think that put aside, we can still continue to produce as much of a good product. A lot of innovation, a lot of new technology, a lot of solutions emanate out of US. We are very strongly leading in that area. And having a responsibility in JTC1 with the leadership with the secretariat for decades uh, proves that we do have the talent and the way with it all to succeed in this area. So I think it's going to be a competitive benefit for us. The organizations that are industry organizations that participate and have a seat at the table as we make the solutions benefit from that. Not only for the country, but also for themselves. They have a competitive advantage to those who don't participate. So inciting people to participate more robustly, even if they're not subsidized, even if they don't have the money to send people to the meetings, I think is a passion that I have developed. We have a business strategy that is, is standards boost business, SBB. 
go to the ANC website and look at how that works. We have created a lot of mechanisms to create excitement about the senior leadership in the policy making areas and in the companies to support the engagement of people like Phil, like his team, like others that are engaged in developing solutions that are going to make not only the country successful, but also their company successful. So I think that's what we need to do. Well, let, let me just uh, add to that, Joe, and I think it's very important for us to look at, um, uh, do we have the right incentives for industry to uh, engage as fully? Um, the other thing uh, to the point, John, that you raised about the numbers of people sitting at the standards table and indeed uh, in incentives and encouragement uh, for the private sector as well as public sector in the U.S. to engage is, uh, is, is clearly important. But it, it's actually the, the most compelling technology story that wins. Yeah. And, uh, and at the end of the day, uh, you can have half the room of, uh, you know, filled with people from another nation but if they're not bringing the compelling technology story and the ability to negotiate the outcome for the right kind of standards to be adopted, um, then, then they're just occupying space. Um, and so we have to look actually at where's the influence coming from? What are, what's the proportion um, of standards contributions that are being made by the US uh, industrial and, and uh, public sector uh, contributors uh, to the uh, uh, to the ultimate outcome of uh, of developing a standard, but it's true um, we are uh, playing against very organized competitors, incentivized competitors, and uh, working together in the United States, looking how we can fully take advantage of the flexibilities of our free market system, driving entrepreneurship and innovation, um, and looking to support the kind of engagement in the standards process. Uh, for the strategic interest of the United States is of interest, I know, to all of us from the U.S. side. Phil, Phil, your thoughts? Thanks. Yeah, and I think Walt's uh, exactly right that it's not a numbers game. It's the compelling technology story that often wins the day. And uh, it's this bottoms up process we have in the U.S., which is uh, is works very well to create compelling technology stories. It comes because experts from different companies are competing with each other to develop the, to submit the idea that get that wins support from the committee it's that competition that ultimately uh, results in in collaboration on a single solution that works very very well um, I, I have to mention uh, you know in the last year we've been hampered a bit in our ability to, to participate internationally by the application of UX export regulations to standard setting it's gotten in the way. I know there's been some recent actions to uh, to improve that, and I hope we can get it all cleared up because that's a that's something which uh, we sh we should we shouldn't be having to uh, to, to worry about. I, I also believe um, we should admire the Chinese commitment over the long term to participating in standard setting. That's one area where our bottoms up process is a little bit challenged. It's often hard for companies to figure out the ROI of participating in that next standard setting meeting and they and they sometimes don't because they're not sure what the benefit is. But if you step back and especially look in the rearview mirror, it's clear that that's an important investment. So I don't have an answer, but I think this is an area for, that would, would warrant more discussion. Is there a way we can instill on top, together with our bottoms up process, a stronger long-term commitment to participating in standards development, especially international standards development. Well, Phil, I'm, I'm so glad you raised that because I think that that really does introduce the, the great question in front of us. Uh, uh, you know, I, I admire what the Chinese are doing. There, there's no question, but they're beginning with an authoritarian mobilization model to do it. And we're now in a competition between free enterprise economies and state capitalism. Uh, they start with a remarkable advantage of having 1.4 billion consumers. And we got 350 million. And now we can, we can level the playing field a bit when working with Europe, but nonetheless, this is a, if you just think about the asymmetry of that, and they have made major commitments, again, I admire them for it, major commitments to become world leaders in 15 technologies. So this question of, uh, you know, it isn't that we're going, to, we can't s slow them up or stop them. I mean, I, they, they have this an internal logic, but we're going to have to improve our game. Mm -hmm. We're gonna to have to improve our game if we're going to compete. When you think about 
being in this, you know, and they've got an economy where there's no cost of capital and you don't have to make a profit. <laughs> That's okay. A big, that's yeah. a big advantage. If you think about that, that's an incredible advantage. Yeah. And yeah. so yeah. this is a challenge for us. And it seems to me that the standard setting process is right in the front line of how we're going to succeed in this great competition. Yeah. So I'm, gl I'm so glad that you brought it up. And that is exactly, we're, we're at the hour, uh, but I would like to just give the three of you a chance for any concluding remarks before we say farewell? Uh, Phil, let me start with you and I'll just work in reverse to Walt and then to Joe. Yeah, thanks, John. This has been a great discussion and uh, I hope we can get together again. Uh, th there's some important things here that we've teed up, uh, but I, I think uh, we, should, uh, we should not lose sight of the fact that, that despite these challenges and different approaches out there, the fundamental approach, the public-private partnership we've used and the bottoms up approach of competing ideas that drive innovation is, is really a gem that should be preserved and treasured and strengthened. And yes, we should strengthen it and, and find ways to improve it, but let's not like, lose sight of what, what really works there. Amen. Walt. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much, John, for convening this. And I agree that there have been a lot of topics that we've just uh, uh, just touched upon uh, that are very uh, ripe for, uh, for follow up. Uh, the United States certainly has the, um, the capacity to continue to lead the world um, in technology and innovation and standards. Uh, it does take the right kind of uh, framework to, uh, to continue this uh, process a productive public-private partnership and uh, looking to the future of how we can synergize uh, uh, between the uh, private sector and the public sector uh, is an area that we're looking uh, at to ensure that while we preserve the principles that have led to American uh, leadership uh, in commerce and innovation globally, uh, we have to be able to continue to, to change our game uh, to, to, uh, to stay ahead uh, while remaining principled. So looking at future investment um, on the public sector side, on the private sector side and investing in the right outcomes and incentivizing the right types of outcomes for ongoing US standards leadership uh, is the journey that we're on for the future. And Joe. You yeah, I would go back to the issue of uh, us not being not friendly uh, with certain nations or certain uh, leadership position people in various countries. I think we are. I think we must maintain connectivity. We must contain relationships. We must nurture those. We should learn from each other. Uh, we have different strengths. We have a strength that Phil described of us having the opportunity to compete for success and looking at different flowers blossoming and see which one works out to be the winner. We have that luxury in this country. Many other countries don't have that luxury. Their systems don't allow that. That's our advantage. It may be a bigger advantage than money, but others have top-down support advantage. But I think we can also learn from each other. We can learn from the best practices. And if we are creating indeed you know, global solutions, it becomes important for us to have both the private sector and the public sector working together. Now, ANSI as being a private sector not-for-profit organization, a lot of reputation, a lot of acceptance globally, has the opportunity to connect with countries like China and others much more effectively in a less high profile way, in a way that we can rely on our linkages. And we don't have to worry about the political situations where we talk about the tensions in trade. We have high profile news going on for two years on how we're going to you know, find each other and how we're going to maybe block some of the products coming back and forth. We don't need to deal with that. So when you deal with standardization, you need to deal with two things. One is doing the right thing, creating the right product, and secondly, maintaining connectivity. So it's in our ability. I can go and talk to the Chinese leadership anytime. I'm a chosen international advisor to them. I can do that in many other countries. So private sector can bring to the table continuity, relationship, linkage that allows us to continue the dialogue so we don't give up on the successes that we have already established and grow on them to the degree that we can work together and hopefully get that final solution that we're seeking, a global solution. So I think we'll work on that. Well, I feel, I feel, like, I feel like I was invited to be the bat boy at a World Series you know, with the All-Stars here. So thank you for 
taking the time to be with us today. Uh, we will follow up because you've, you've touched on some very important issues that I think we should explore in greater depth. But for tonight, today, thank you. Let me just say great thanks to the three of you. This has been a splendid session. And I thank wish you, you all well. Us. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, John. See you now. All right. Bye-bye.